I'm going to start as follows. This is a sign that nobody in town wants to see if you're a fan of Milford Sports, you can rack and otherwise. And yet it's a sign, it's a field closure sign that we see all too often um, at our high school stadium field. Um, honestly, as a fan of sports here in Milford, this is the kind of field that I would like to see on our stadium field. Um, line for football, yes, but more importantly, equally importantly, line for soccer, field hockey, boys and girls lacrosse. There's far more use to, um, that this field can be put to than it's currently um, being utilized, in large part because of it's a natural turf field, and the, the limitations um, on it are pretty significant. Um, just to do a little bit of uh, vision boarding here a little bit, Hitchner Field at Spartan Stadium, Aileen Candle Field at Spartan Stadium, the Amato Family Field, Granite Town Field, Alumni Field, all within our reach, all within Milford's reach. Um, good, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin St. Ange. Uh, those of you um, that are here in the audience and on Granite Town Media may know me from a couple of different roles that I played. I'm originally from Milford, a graduate of this high school. Um, <clears throat> some of you know that um, a couple years ago, two years ago, in fact, um, I was, uh, uh, <laughs> I had to do some community service. As a result, I was served four months as an appointed member of our school board. In addition to that, <clears throat> I'm also um, the play-by-play -play voice of Spartan football on Granite Town Media. Um, in that role, I sit in the press box in the fall, and I, in addition to watching our football team play uh, four or five games a, a year on the home turf, travel with the team a little bit, but I get to see the deterioration of our stadium field from August through September, through October, through November. Uh, because I live here in town, I also see um, that our other teams are just frankly unable to use the field as much as they could or should. Um, tonight, I'd like to start the conversation with our community about how we can remedy that. Years ago, under the direction of other people, um, some of whom are here tonight, started the process to reconfigure our athletic facilities. That included a track, it included moving the fields, it included a stadium, it included lights. What it included at the time was also resurfacing the field. And that just didn't happen at that time. And that's okay, progress comes at a cost, and there are times when you have to make important decisions. Um, and, and maybe some things you know, wind up on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Well, now's the time to finish the project that others started before. To that end, tonight, um, again, we want to start the conversation here in town about this initiative. We've brought in representatives from a company called Field Turf, Andrew um, Dijak and Christopher Hulk are here from Field Turf. They brought samples, um, brochures, and they're going to share with us a PowerPoint presentation about their company. The question that precipitated them coming here tonight is why artificial turf? Very simply, two reasons. We want to extend the spring and the fall athletic seasons so that we can play longer into the fall and start earlier in the spring. We want to increase the number of playable days and nights so that we lose fewer games and practices to inclement weather conditions. Both are accomplishable without damaging um, the surface if it's an artificial surface. What are the costs? We're going to find out a lot more about that, info, about that tonight. But the costs are real, but they're attainable. They're attainable through hard work, effort, um, and, and frankly, all of the good things that make Milford the town that it is. I think if we roll up our sleeves together, we can raise a lot of money both from local businesses, alumni, and I think we can get creative in some of our financing. Who will it service? High school and middle school. I'm gonna pause there for a second. High school and middle school. The reason I say it can also service the middle school, increased playability um, means that we shouldn't have field deterioration. And I mentioned the middle school because my cousin was the middle school boys soccer coach last year. I went to their championship game that was played on the North River Road fields in basic darkness, in basically a desert. Championship game, played in the worst facility I've ever seen. They should have been under the lights. They should have been on the stadium field. The, the kids earned that by virtue of their success on the field. It's not a matter of earning that. There are kids. We have a facility. We have a resource. They should be there anyway. High school and middle school student athletes that play field hockey, boys and girls soccer, boys and girls lacrosse, marching band, cheerleading, football, all would benefit by upgrades to our facility. Who else will it service? 
The Milford Recreation Department has a number of athletic offerings. It will serve, it, it could be utilized to help service them. MCAA, our local community athletic association, boys and girls youth soccer, Spartan Junior Football and Cheerleading. I also think there's an opportunity to expand offerings to private organizations. I drive by Hampshire Dome, um, you know, year round and I hear about adult leagues, soccer leagues, men's leagues, women's leagues, and so forth playing in the dome. I, I dare say there's probably some interest in playing outdoor soccer, perhaps under the lights, perhaps on days or at times when we're not otherwise uh, making use of the facility. How to fund it. I'm going to target one, use a $1.5 million target. Some people might think it's a little high. Honestly, we won't know until we start talking to companies like Field Turf. Um, sorry for my slide, it's a little, obviously I, I'm not a PowerPoint person. Um, I think that we can raise $100,000 through alumni don donations. There are a lot of athletes that have come through these um, these doors here at this high school that have gone on to professional business and professional success. I think that with an aggressive effort, we can raise $100,000 um, from our alumni. Existing teams, the very ones that I just mentioned on the previous slides, I think can be, tar can be asked to target over the next 12 to 18 months, $10,000 each. I think $200,000 from our teams and organizations um, is a realistic fundraising goal. The school district currently has a capital reserve fund to the tune of about $400,000. It's already approved by the voters. Uh, I see no reason why we can't make use of some or all of those funds. Being conservative, half of those funds currently in place is another $200,000. I further believe that signage in the stadium can net an additional $300,000. We currently have no signage in the stadium. We currently have no fundraising through advertising in our facilities. That probably requires a little bit of research uh, as to board policy and or NHIAA policy on signage. Or I spent 20 years in New Jersey. Every field that I visited in New Jersey had significant signage and therefore significant revenue fall into the programs every year by virtue of that signage. We have about 300 feet of chain link fence um, that faces the field, unobstructed views during, you know, during events when people are sitting in the stands. It's great signage, and I think it's a, a, a tremendous opportunity that's being missed. I do think the taxpayers need to be asked and should be um, expected to approve. Expected may be the wrong word. It's a political process. I get that. But if we can raise 53 to 54 percent of the revenue, I dare say that going to the taxpayers and asking to pay the balance is a very reasonable request. Tonight, after we hear from our representatives from Field Turf, I'm going to ask those in the audience to complete a survey. Do you support artificially turfing the high school stadium field, yes or no? You just have to let me know which survey you want. Do you want the yes survey or the no survey? I didn't bring the no surveys with me tonight, so I won't, I'll have to get back to you on those. Um, I'm kidding. Of course, yes. <laughs> the, uh, if you vote yes, though, I'm also going to ask, would you be willing to volunteer to join us in supporting the Turf at Milford Committee? There are any number of activities that we are going to need a lot of assistance with. In addition tonight, there's a pledge sheet up here um, for anyone interested in, in pledging and making a donation. We already have $1,000 in pledges, uh, one from a really good looking former alum. Basically, I've forfeited all of my haircut money over the next 10 years to fund this pledge. Um, I was gonna ask if there are any questions. We're gonna hold the questions until after you hear from our field um, turf representatives, but I believe that this is, as I indicated, the starting, the starting point of the conversation to end this and get to this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Field Turf, Andrew Dijak, and Christopher Hall. Why it's safer and 
answer any questions that you have. So Chris is going to talk about the hard stuff, and I'm just going to talk about the easy stuff. <laughs> All right, no pressure for me, I guess. Not <laughs> at all. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Chris Holk. I'm the Director of Design and Construction for Field Turf. Uh, been a professional engineer designing turf fields for the last 15-ish years. Um, so you guys have a very typical situation that we find in New England where you have a grass field that used to be able to be usable for everybody, uh, but now with increased demand on, on field time and the fact that you have lights out there, uh, people really want to be able to use the field and to have a grass field in the New England climate you're just very limited on what you can do how you can maintain it and how you can get everyone to use it um, you know obviously there's a, a bit of big demand in the synthetic turf industry to have new fields and the main reason for that is that increased playability of the field um, the safety factor that you're able to maintain a very safe playable field no matter how many people you put on it um, it's not to say that they're maintenance free, but it's much easier to maintain a safe field. Um, in reviewing these types of facilities, usually how these things go is people get a turf field, and then they try to get lights, and then they try to get a track. You guys, luckily enough, already have a great track. You have a, a state-of-the-art lighting system. So the thing that's going to increase the playability of your field really gets you to the situation where you're able to have revenue for the field and you know make it so everyone can use it is by going with a synthetic turf. Um, so starting off this process, I think you guys are really starting off with the right foot here. Uh, can we change the arrow? Next slide. Um, so looking at this, this is kind of the, an aerial of existing fields versus trying to get up to kind of what the rendering shows up there about what it could be. Um, some of those steps will be, you know, installing the new synthetic turf field. That will include the removal of the topsoil, uh, regrading of the field, uh, new football goal posts, because as we change the elevation of the field with the grass crown going to a flatter synthetic turf field, um, you change those out to have a newer system. Um, some of the things that we see on these fields, um, it's called ball safety netting. So if you have a situation where um, you're having track practice and lacrosse practice at the same time, you can safely have those two things going on without lacrosse balls hitting people. Um, then, you know, one of the things that, that we try to do with these fields is the existing irrigation system will be capped in probably, probably one or maybe two of the corners. Uh, that allows for a couple things. One, uh, the main one being maintenance uh, for the field. So if you need to go and plug a hose in and wash the stands, you can do that. If you need to go clean up some puke, you, know, you can do that, clean up some blood. So that, you know, we, would, we would cut off the existing irrigation, um, to make it accessible for you to still use. Um, some of the times we'll add conduits in to make track and field events um, set up a little bit more easily. Uh, instead of having wires all over the place, you can run those underground. Um, and for the way that this project would really be installed, we would come in and basically cut a smooth surface right at the edge of the track, um, probably eight inches to a foot off of lane one. Uh, right now, if you walk the track, there's a variation of probably 18 inches to a foot of extra space inside of lane one. We would cut a smooth line there and put in what's called a concrete turf anchor curb. Uh, showing an example of that on the, on the bottom left here. Uh, so you'll have kind of twofold. The, the concrete allows the turf to stay in place and it also allows the uh, track to stay in place. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the edges falling off because now you'll have the concrete that really um, creates a uh, distinct barrier between the two. Um, as far as the constructability of the field that you have now, really I don't see any major concerns. Um, I think that the track is very easily, we, we, can, we can go over that uh, without any impact to that. Um, I'll come back to that one. This is a, a typical situation where we'd have an existing track that we would go over. Um, in this case, we cut back on the top left we cut back about a foot on this one. We bridged over the track, that's the on the top right side. 
we installed new concrete edging and then put back new track surfacing. Uh, in this case, I think we don't have to necessarily put back new track surfacing, but in general, this would be the same sort of situation you would end up with. Um, so really no concerns as far as the constructability standpoint in getting a new field. Um, just to touch base a little bit on how the field operates, um, you have an existing drainage system. Uh, there's, I think, six yard drains that go along the exterior of the field. Um, right now, looking at those, um, I would say that they're a little bit of a tripping hazard, a um, bit of a safety concern as you would step off of the track if you're not paying attention. You know, those things are down 12 inches to 18 inches and they can really, you know, cause concern for somebody who's not paying attention. Um, the good news is that you do have a good infrastructure in place. Um, so the new synthetic turf field would make use of a dynamic stone base, which allows for uh, really good drainage stone. That drainage stone would then tie into what we call a perimeter collector pipe. Um, and then at that point, we can tie into the existing drainage system uh, and have the water evacuated from the site uh, without having to cut the turf, or sorry, cut the track or really impact anything outside of the interior limits of the track facility. Um, here is just a pretty typical situation where we have the collector pipes on the picture at the top. On the edges, um, the grading of the new field will be about a half a percent going off to the edges um, with turf going straight up to the limits of the track itself. So you won't see any more drains. Those drains will be raised to be flush with the bottom of the turf. And then the, the storm drainage actually drains vertically down through the storm, storm stone base and then gets off to the sides and gets evacuated from the field. Versus now, some infiltrates and then some runs off to the sides. So this one runs into the stone base and then off of the field. So that increases the playability significantly. That makes it so that if you're having large rainstorm events, you can play on it almost immediately. Um, and you know, makes it so it's really an all weather field. The other nice part about that is in situations where you might be having to plow the field, uh, what you would do is you leave the plow up about an inch, um, plow off that uh, accumulated snow, and then the, once the sun comes out, it's able to melt the uh, remaining inch or so extremely quickly um, so that you have a playable field uh, you know, almost instantaneously. instantaneously. Um, so this is uh, just one example project that we've done recently. Uh, we completed this one uh, over, the, over this last summer. This is Amity Regional High School down in Connecticut. Um, they had a grass field and a track. We were able to replace the grass field. Uh, they ended up replacing their track too, but they had a situation where, very similar to you guys, they had a grass field that looked really good sometimes of the year, but they could only use it you know, four or five times a year. When it would have a large rain source event, the field would get flooded out. Um, so although they had a good infrastructure in place, it really was not a very usable facility. Um, so they were able to do this upgrade. They substantially improved the drainage system. They had playability now um, basically from 2 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night with their lighting systems every night. So they were able to do that and run out for their facility. Um, so these things are not rocket science. Um, they're things that we're able to do all the time. You know, in New England, I think we do 30 to 40 of these types of projects a year. You know, maybe 500 to 1,000 of them throughout the country. So um, it's a very doable thing as far as um, how your facility is set up and the ability to go to a synthetic turf field. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Um, and then come back for any questions at the end, and uh, Andrew will talk a little bit about the company itself. Thanks. Um, that's a very good description. It's not rocket science, but I still can't build the field myself, obviously. So we have engineers. Anyway, so we, today we're going to, right after this, we're going to talk about just the company itself, um, a couple different turf systems, because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, safety, which is you know, it looks great, the field looks great, it drains great, you never really have a rain out ever, but the most important thing is that it's much safer than anything else on the market and much, much safer than a natural surface field. Um, you know, why that is, a little bit about our company and then some local stuff that we've done uh, recently. 
So, you know, there's different ways to kind of go about any business. What we have is what we call vertical integration, where we're building everything that we that we sell and we install everything that we make. So from the fiber, we even do tracks, but we do fiber, uh, the backing, we tough it ourselves, we procure all the infill, and then we install it ourselves with our own installation team. So it's literally a one size, one stop shop. If you decided to pull the trigger and say, hey, I want to do this, Chris would be, and I would be your contact throughout the whole thing, and we would be only dealing with field turf employees. Um, that's, that's the way field turf does it. Uh, we have an overall revenue of Tarket Sports of over three, or excuse me, of Tarket Company over three billion dollars, and Field Turf is the, the largest revenue source in that company. Um, we have an eight-year, up to a ten-year, third-party certified warranty, and there's never been a claim uh, ever in the history of our company on our warranty. So I think we've been around for over 20 years, close to 25 years. Um, so. The actual turf system varies based on the type of sport. So it's not like, uh, hey, you want a professional soccer field versus I want you know, a little league field versus hey, I want a strictly lacrosse field. They're all different. So there's three different types. One of them is a monofilament that's soccer centric, soccer only. Looks really good, looks like natural grass, but only soccer folks really want to play on it. Slip film, which is a faster ball roll and uh, it's better underfoot. Uh, and then hybrid, which is like in a high school situation, you never have like one centric field. So it's always multiple people playing on it, just like your field. There's football, soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, different types of lacrosse, et cetera. And for that concept, we use what's called a hybrid turf for both monofilament and uh, slip film. So we, we, have a, we have an approach for everything. If you want to build multiple fields, but it's just a soccer, that's fine too. But the hybrid approach is what's going to work on a field like yours. Ours is called Vertex um, or Vertex Prime. Um, we have two different levels of turf. We have what's called our Prestige Line, which is pretty good turf. Um, it's what everybody in the other than field turf can build in the industry. Um, and then we have an elite level series that only field turf can uh, build and only field turf can install. Um, there's a little bit of a price difference, it's not huge. And as we go forward, we'll introduce. Hopefully we go forward and keep talking about this. We'll introduce the concepts and the values that kind of that differentiate uh, the prestige line from our elite line as well. Um, and that's our dual fiber uh, product. Um, so a couple things. One of the most important thing uh, up front is like, okay, my field's there. I'm going to spend all this money putting all this drainage in. What is it going to do? And the field drains uh, a, a tremendous amount. The stone base itself will drain over 100 inches an hour. And the backing without infill in it would be about 120 inches an hour. Once you put infill in it, you're at about 60 to 70 inches an hour. That's an enormous, obviously, it's never going to happen. The only way it could possibly even flood is if it was in a bowl and you had water pouring off like the side or off the stands, and then you, know, you could see a little bit of water on the surface. For your application, you'll never have rain out. You're never going to get 70 inches of water in an hour. It just never, ever, ever happens. Um, so, the, the, the main thing behind our carpet is that we don't have we don't have holes in the bottom of the carpet. You're like, well, how does it drain? It drains because you can look at the samples. The the fabric is coated just where the fibers are tufted, and all other aspects of that fiber of that carpet can drain. The other huge benefit is no stone gets up into the turf system, and then also none of the infill leaves the turf system. So that's that's a huge component. Basically, that was, a lot, that was a lot of words to say you never have a rain out. You may have to worry about it for a long time. Um, the next thing is there's different levels and different quality of rubber. Uh, we use cryogenic rubber. It's processed cryogenically. It's a lot cleaner. And it also passes European safety standard tests. So that our rubber passes the same test as like toothbrushes, to kids' toys, um, you know, thermometer, all that stuff. It passes that, it passes that test so it's safe for... Um, it's safe for any activity level. It's safe for any person. Um, you know, it's just it's safe for everybody. So we use a high quality rubber. It's called cryogenic rubber. Um, one of the benefits of cryogenic rubber is that it doesn't float in water. So a lot of the times you go to a turf field and you get a heavy rain, you'll see kind of rubber flying all over the place. Or you have rubber in your shoes, rubber in your hair, and all that other stuff. Um, with cryogenic rubber, it maintains its composure 
even even on heavy rain events, so the, the rubber's not going all over the place, and you don't see a lot of that splash. If you're watching a football game on TV, and you see this huge amount of splash line all over the place, it's not a cryogenic rubber field, it's an ambient rubber field, which is a little bit less quality. Um, so that's, that's an important feature. Um, and then, you know, the, the biggest thing that we, we try to uh, say is it's safer all around. So we think, we know we have the safest compared to other turf companies, and it's not even close because we use um, a tremendous amount of infill per square foot. But from a natural surface field, especially in the Northeast, to a synthetic field, injury rates are, are almost 70% less with a, with a synthetic turf field. You know, why is that? Well, nobody has a million bucks to spend on maintaining the field. You know, nobody does. So when it gets cold or when there's not enough grass or there's not enough, you know, it doesn't get aerated or things of that nature, things just fall by the wayside in the lower body uh, injuries like knee, ankle, hip, all that stuff just shoots up. Um, this slide we use, I mean, I use this slide, we were in Exeter in the field last year. VAD um, was also a football coach. He was like, when we talked to him about injury prevention, and we said, hey, you choose our lead product, nine pounds of info per square foot. You can see what happens when you go less square foot, the injury skyrocket. He looked at this slice, that was a no-brainer. We're gonna use nine pounds a square foot, and we're gonna use the same stuff that's in, you know, that life, that sort of thing. So, that, that's, from a safety standpoint, there are reasons behind it, but just know, Turf to turf, definitely better, but from natural surface to turf, it's just, it's not even close, especially in the Northeast, which is very difficult to grow grass, I mean, extremely difficult. Um, so the other thing is you want to make sure that over time that your turf wears, so it's not like you put the turf in three years later, you're like, what the heck's going on here? Um, so, you know, there's different quality of fiber, um, there's different types of fiber, and we're, we're kind of at the forefront of testing along with Penn State University. They use this machine called the Lisport Wear Testing. It basically generates um, a test to say, okay, this many cycles equals this many years. So they, they, they did it for in 10,000 um, cycle increments and then looked at fiber. And usually there's always a breakdown. So they go 10,000 cycles back and forth. They look at the fiber, there's a little bit of breakdown. 10,000 more, but you can obviously see where I'm getting at, more usage more fiber breakdown. So we developed the fiber, um, and we have a, a few of them, Rev360 is just one of them, uh, which is a monofilament that just didn't break down. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that the, you're never gonna need a new field, but what I am gonna say is that the fiber in and of itself, with extraordinary amount of wear, isn't gonna break down. What Penn State did is they usually do a test for 30,000 cycles, they went to 60,000, they went to 80,000, they went to 100,000 cycles, they looked at the fiber and there's still no breakdown. So the quality of the fiber, if it doesn't break down, it will maintain the integrity of the infill and then your field lasts a long, long time. I'm not saying, you know, a million years, but with our elite system, you can get up to a 10 year warranty and it's gonna last you a lot longer than that if you maintain it. I think, I think Exeter's field is 15 years old, to be honest with you. So it's a long, long time. Um, the vertical integration is important because um, there's no finger pointing. So if the, if the fiber doesn't do well, or the install's not up to par, or the design's not great, or something happens, there's no finger pointing. It's always coming back to us, and we will always, you know, obviously make it right. So it's not like, oh, hey, we did a great job installing, Chris did a great job doing the installation, the fiber's falling apart, it's somebody else's problem, it's not. It's a, it's a one-stop shop solution. Um, the other thing um, that's important is after you install the field, what do you do on a, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis, every two, what are you doing? And we can teach you, there's one or two options, because they're not maintenance-free fields, but they are limited maintenance fields, you need to do a little bit of maintenance. Either we'll teach you on how to groom the field yourself, or we have in-house uh, customer service folks that will come and maintain your field for you. It costs obviously a little bit more money than you do it yourself, but we have employees that do that. And with a very limited amount of maintenance, we can teach you how to do it depending on playability, where the wear pattern is, um, how many sports are on it. If you do it correctly, it will last again a long time. And we have in-house in -house staff and personnel that actually do that as well. Um, so I think just wrapping up, I think we went over a ton of stuff from you know, why you should do it to like building it to you know, how great we are as a company, et cetera. But, the, the, the biggest value, especially in this venue, is questions. 
So like, if anybody has any questions on, hey, what's this about, or you know, I, I want to understand that more, anything, I think now's the time, um, especially if it's because we're in its infancy. And so you can kind of steer kind of where you're going at this point. So if anybody has any questions from any of us, I would say, hey, listen, let's talk about it and kind of get it out. So um, with that, kind of concludes what we're showing you. But if you guys have anything for us, we're happy to answer it. While you guys are thinking about your questions, I want to say thank you to both uh, Andrew and Christopher for coming up. I want to thank you all for coming out as well. Um, we'll take a couple of minutes and answer any, your any questions. Time. Yeah, we got time. We, we got plenty of time. They don't have to be back to Southern Connecticut until tomorrow. Until two in the morning, so we're good. <laughs> no, but this is, uh, this, is, this is, as I introduced it before, this is a, a conversation. And so uh, I think the first question will probably lead to the next question. Yeah. It might lead to some back and forth. But you had a question, sir. Thank you, man. By the way, I got two kids in high school, one in sixth grade, so I have a best interest in it. Um, what's the time? Say it gets approved. What's the time frame? Yeah. Is that discussed? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you, we talked about this a little bit before, usually from the first contact with somebody until you're playing on the field, average is like 18 months, just because you have funding. It could be five years, it could be whatever it is. But from when you say, I want to do this, to getting the field done is about a six month time period. So if you want to write the check, yeah, right now, right, right. we can be done in about eight months. Usually, usually, usually the process is in the fall, you're like, hey, I want to start doing this, so October-ish. We, we do a design, we uh, permit the field, because uh, you have to do permitting because it's a, the water. Or so do all that stuff, that leads into the spring, and then in the summer, June, July, and August is when the fields are usually getting made. So it's about a three-month construction project. But overall, it takes about six months from I want to do this to your plan. Great so question. Kevin talked about you know his magic number of 1.5 million. You know how how, how what, what is the like the more realistic cost of this thing? Two. Two million. Two million. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. Uh, so it depends. The, the reason it's at 1.5 is because we have no idea what the scope is. We have no clue how far we have to go down, how much curb work we have to do. We, we have to take out a minimum to make the field level one, one D zone area and kind of rebuild it. Uh, you may want, you know, different goal, you have to have goal poles, you may want netting, there's a lot of stuff going on. And the timing is undefined. So just as an example, the first three months of the year, prices skyrocket. So, I, you know, if you can say, hey, I want to do the field next year, we can kind of hone that. On average, a design build project is about $13 a square foot. On average, you have about 90,000 square feet, put you in the 1.2 1.3 range. And then you have extra stuff. You know, you have, you might want a feature pad, or you might want the netting's on it. You just don't know what you want. So it's realistic with the information that we have. So we get, you know, it's a budget, it's a range. And as we get closer, that budget gets more defined. Um, but you're, it's a minimum $13 a square foot. Worst case scenario, what would the final price be if we got the netting? We got yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right around 1.5. Yeah, that's that's so right. Like 1.3 was the initial, or 1.2, and then that's it. The difference. Yeah, a, a couple hundred thousand contingency. The way we do it is we say, okay, what what's the real cost of just the field? That's about 1.2 to 1.3, and then you know there's always extra stuff while you're doing the project you want to throw in. Plus, in, from an inflationary measure, we don't know what's going to happen. All of, every product that we have is pretty much based out of oil, <laughs> everything. So the, the, the fluctuations are immense. Plus truck, we truck from Georgia to New Hampshire for this project, trucking has gone, has tripled. So next year, is it lower? Maybe, right, so nobody, right, nobody knows. So that, that's, you know, when we're throwing numbers around, we never wanna give you a number, and then when the project comes in, we're 50,000 more, because then we look like, I don't know what we're doing, so. Without equipment costs, yeah, that's not that much. Yeah, that's very short. That's like seventy five hundred dollars total. You get two pieces of equipment, um, and that's included in that number. Now, if you were to, you know, use us as a service, it's about three to five thousand per year. Um, you know, our machine costs about hundred thousand dollars, and we more deeply groom it. But if you, you the maintenance equipment that we give you as part of the package, if you use it regularly, we won't. What other schools locally have you field turfed? Yeah, so we're just so yeah, southern. We just did southern New Hampshire twice actually. We, High schools. 
Oh, uh, Hollis Brookline High School. We just did the Dairyfield School. Did Exeter High School last year, and then we did Phillips Exeter last year as well. What are the um, What are the immediate short-term maintenance costs? Like, what's when we get if you have an installation and it says okay, it's, the project's finally finished. How long until a major maintenance item that outside you know repairs or whatever? Yeah. That, like, what's the first stage of a maintenance item, and how much does that cost? Yeah, the first thing you do is you do nothing. You want to break the field in a little bit. You want to the slip foam fibers to fold over, sure. and you want to play on the field. Um, th that's the first thing you want to do. Then it depends on sport. So if you have field hockey and they're taking a million shots off of one section, you're going to have some infill displacement. So a maintenance, maybe like a weekly maintenance thing, might be just to go refill that one area. Um, if you don't have that constant aggressive in one, one area, maybe you know you may be three or four times a year using the equipment that we give you to be able to do and that would happen after the first like six months. Okay. So I'm here, I work with the Boosters Club, yep. do a whole bunch of this stuff. So one of the things that's important as I see it is consider this field will probably have the most highest use of any field in town yep. if this will get done. I mean we, besides gym classes during the day, football, soccer, lacrosse, marching band, field hockey, middle school sports, like Kevin had mentioned. Right. So consider this piece of real estate heavily used right so when you when i ask my questions yeah. uh because i've just got a bunch that seem ideal to ask if this was in this state I, I, so just can, with your answer just consider it that i'm going for the, the worst case scenario yeah. highest use possible i would do this is what i if i if it was my field my money i would get by the maintenance equipment that we have that we give you you buy sure, it's yeah. a 700 bucks it's a groomer and a sweeper you would use that three to four times a year and every year to 18 months, maybe every two years, you have our guys come in at 3,000 bucks and you can feel like super professionally. That will allow you to extend the life of your field by, I'm not going to give you a number, it's a tremendous amount. It's a tremendous amount. Exeter, for example, they have the very similar use that you do. They have lights, they have five sports, they play on it constantly. They use our service every year, every year. And there's field lessons. And what did you say was the general, what your 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 service cost per year? Well, it's it's three. It's, if you depend, not like a salesman, it depends. Right? No, so no, no. Long, like you say, months, consider worst case. Like yeah, you didn't come back here every year to recondition. If you did one, if you got a one service contract, it's one time is three thousand dollars. If you buy ten years worth, that number drops down considerably. For so a maintenance program. Yes, yeah, right. Okay. So the reason why it's like, we just recently went to the thing with the food with. The track. So we installed the track and then there was a big hubbub and pushing off maintenance that's a problem in our town of deferring the cost right. when they came down the street. And we didn't want to do that with that track. And it was a cost of eighty thousand dollars just to resurface. Resurface that track. it, right. So consider that the, the upfront cost is going to be a major sticker shock. Then all the other little questions are going to come out from the other stakeholders involved. You know, the school district, the school board, the town people that we're all paying for, right? Yep. So it's we're going to be looking up front is What's the long-term effect? Not just having it, because once we have it, we know everyone in, in, is going to want to use it. Yeah. So let me jump on this one a little bit, Dave, if I may. Sure. Um, awesome question, and we need to get to the bottom of that, because the, the way to get to the bottom of that is to juxtapose the answers to the questions you're asking that we get from a company like a field turf or their competitors, but then compare that against what is the real cost to maintain a grass or a natural field. And I say the real cost because I don't know that we're incurring that real cost. If we were, we probably have a better grass field. But what would the real cost be, I heard from Andrew tonight, to maintain a New England field of this nature, 90,000 square feet, what per it's year? a million bucks to get it to play five sports. So you need to irrigate it, which is water it. I'll ask the athletic director here just by a nod of the head, are we watering the field? <laughs> I, I, I take that, that, that response as, a, as, as probably not. Are we fertilizing the field? <laughs> Those are the costs that we have to compare it against. Yeah. And, and, and that's my point. My only point in answering in response to your question is every question you're asking is spot on. We need to balance that and compare it to a comparative analysis against what would the actual cost be if we were maintaining the field correctly. Right. And then obviously we're, we're not. <laughs> so there's a, there's a departure there. Um, and the other, the other that's thing, part of the analysis yeah. that, that this conversation sure. leads to. The other right. thing I think you're looking for is like, what's the payback? So that's like, like what's the payback? What's the, so there's two things. One, if you were to get our Mac Daddy maintenance program, it's about 60000 over a 10-year period. Okay. You put, that's, you're getting multiple visits every year, so that's about the maximum. Right. Um, and the payback 
is usually seen after the first replacement. So you spend all this money up front, you use the heck out of yep, the field sure. from an hour to hour thing, you flip the field, the cost is a fraction. About a year into that flip, that's when they call it their internal rate of the return flips, and now you're actually making money on the money you spent. And that takes a little bit of time. So a, a couple of comments that you had made in the early part of your presentation contradict something that I've been told is general knowledge, because right next door in Amherst they have a turkey field that, from my understanding, is ready to be resurfaced. So it's, that's the, the questions people start to ask, like, okay, we get it. Now, does it have a lifespan where in 10 years we're then going to have to incur the same cost all over again? Or if, with regular maintenance, can we say with a certainty, with extreme high usage, we would get, say, 25 years use out of it? Right. So the more we can stretch out that time, it's not, 20, that not, it's not 25, but I'll compare it to other like fields that have, there's different levels of qualities of turf, and there's different levels of quality of maintenance, right? So they can range from, you're not going to get through your warranty period, that's seven or eight years, all the way up to double that. So we, a couple of uh, like high-end fields, we had, we had Exeter High School, which is a big one. We had the Dairy Field School, which is another big one. And then we had uh, Husson, um, Co Husson College, also kind of like the same thing. High-end system, maintained it properly, 15 years. Now, well, I'm not guaranteeing 15 years, so you know, we're not. No, we're, not we're not holding you there. Right. But, but, <laughs> but, but the warranty in an elite system right now is 10 years, and they got 15 years out of it. Okay. So it's a, but I can't like, you know, it, it, it's apples. If you want an apples to apples comparison, that's what I'd be suggesting for your field, and if that's what you did. You got you got 15 big ones. Okay. You, have, you said uh, prestige. Classic. Pre yeah, there's different. prestige and elite. I mean, one of them has lower end rubber, not as much infill. The fiber isn't as good. The backing isn't as good. We obviously install it all the time, but it's just a different system. You pay about forty thousand dollars more. You get 30% more infill, a fiber that lasts, you know, 100,000, but a better infill system, more infill, and a better backing. And the delta is about $40,000 between the two. Let me jump in on this real quick. Yeah. So just, uh, just on that narrow point, um, our representatives brought some samples. So just we can wrap ask. up our formal presentation. Take the time, go touch, you know, touch and feel, and, and ask the same questions there. And, and, the yeah. I was just going to ask some materials. Yeah. I didn't know if you had like a like a spreadsheet or a grid that says if you use this number of sports, you would recommend this this style of field uh, turf, yeah. and then you know how how long the maintenance wise or cost per square foot. That's yeah, it's all owner driven. Like we, I, I hate to say you have to, but for you, you're screaming dual fiber, nine pounds, multi U. Yeah, and the you know the, the the longest you want the longest lasting. You don't have a light field that you play on ten times a year. You're going to have you know a thousand events a year on it. Here's the advocacy piece, and, and keep asking your questions. My, you know, he's going to give you the technical answer. I'm going to give you the advocacy piece. We want it to be used a thousand times a year. I want it to be a problem for this community that because we're making such a use of it that we have to replace it at an earlier date because it's, you know, we we put the best maintenance program in place, but our kids are out there all of the time. Yeah, sure. That's a great problem to have. I'd like to be part of solving. Oh that. yeah, we've, we're. Two corners on the same ship plot. Yeah, we've had this conversation before. Absolutely. We're done before. So. Okay. And then that number, that one five number that we're talking about to replace it. I mean, I don't know who the heck knows what the price is going to be ten years, but today you're at about a half a million, maybe a little under, depending on infill reuse to replace the field. All the infrastructure stays the same. We're just taking the carpet out. If you use high end infill, you can reuse that infill just with new carpet. So, the question of the warranty in ten years. So if we came back in five years and there was an issue, would the school have to show you documentation of either this? You call me. I mean, literally, you call me up or call our customer service number and we come out and fix it. Unless it's a guy. I mean, we've had a couple, like, you know, a car drives on the field and does a donut. That's not covered, obviously. But, like, normal wear and tear items, a line comes up, a seam comes up, you have issues with fiber, issues with the infill, it'll be fixed all that. Um, there's, it, it, we go above and beyond. We had a tree fall on a, a, a field, we fixed it. Like, we're pretty liberal when it comes to that. There's not a, a huge thing, but yeah, no, there's no certain, you know, we, we hold everything, it's our guys um, and gals up in, you know, the customer service center that, that does, or you just call me and we take care of it. It's a national company, international, national brand. Um, Kevin talked a lot about donations and donations and Likely is it that a town or a district can raise 56% of the funds before they go to their 
and I've dealt with a couple jobs in Southern Connecticut, you know, in Fairfield County, where somebody walks in and just says, there you go, it's a million five, but it just depends. Comparatively speaking, it's not out of the question. Uh, you know, I think he was saying more like 500,000 uh, out of the one five. I, I don't think that's unbearable. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with signage. We did a field up in Maine last year, which I was shocked when they raised a couple hundred thousand dollars putting logos on the field. And so that logo is there for 10 or 15 years, and they're paying an annual fee to the, to the, to the school to do that, plus they're paying the cost of the logo. So it's, not, it's definitely not unheard of. It's not easy, but it's not, it's not unheard of at all. We have, I mean, you know, the per capita income in Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, versus you know, the, some, you know, town in northern Maine is a lot different, so it just completely depends. But he, the, what he's talking about is not like pie in the sky. It's real deal stuff. Plus, you know, we talked before, there's financing stuff you can do. There's, there's a variety of ways you can procure and finance a job. I'm not, aware, uh, I'm not aware of the percent usage. I didn't, I, I'm not sure about that, to be honest, but I can't. But the U.S. soccer has one. The NFL has, has one as well. Um, we, we can give you the, we're not going to apply for it, but we'll give you all the information to say, hey, this is the information that they're looking for. The, u, the usage percentages, I've never heard that before. I don't, I don't know if it's a different, different type of thing. There were a few that I looked up before. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I, I don't know how you would even let document that. I mean, I, I mean, so, right. The thing about the, the grants are great. They're just very competitive, and you know, they're sometimes hard to get. But um, I love that question because this is our first conversation about this. We're in our infancy. We're looking for people to help us. There is no committee right now. It's a committee of one or two just starting a conversation. And those of you that are here in attendance, uh, expressing interest is, is awesome. And those that are going to watch on on Facebook or otherwise. We need volunteers to uh, step forward and, and maybe work with me or others on grant writing and, and some of those applications. I don't think we should leave any stone unturned in, in, with respect to that. And I'll work with anybody. I'll be happy to uh, offload any of these particular projects. I know a lot of work was done in the early days. Mark Morrill, you know, shared a lot of information about a lot of the fundraising that went into um, the track development, the lighting, the stands, and, and, and the, you know, in the early 2000s and, and the early teens. I, I don't want to recreate the wheel. I think there are some really supportive people here in town um, that um, might be interested in this project. And so um, if, you know, if we can generate a little bit of momentum um, and get some assistance and some help in that respect, in that regard, I think it'd be great. I noticed that uh, we've been joined a little in, in, in progress by Superintendent of Schools, Christy Michaud. Christy, thanks for joining us. I won't put you on the spot and ask you any questions, but I want to acknowledge that you're here. And thank you so much for coming out. Um, afterwards, if you have some questions for us, I'd be happy to talk to you and talk you through some of the things that were presented tonight as well. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Any other questions? Any other conversation? Did anybody um, look into the percentage that the taxpayer would potentially have a burden for? What that would cost each taxpayer potentially? I didn't, I didn't detail the numbers to that extent. No. So the way you would have to take, it's kind of, I, I did, you want to talk about this or? Um, I, I didn't run the numbers to that extent, um, but that's certainly, you know, any kind of a bond that's going to go to the town is going to have that spelled out to that degree. And I can, we can just draw on, on our prior experiences, half a million dollars is going to be X and, you know, uh, 30 cents per five, you know, per hundred thousand, whatever it might be. No, the answer is no, we haven't gotten that information yet, but we'll get there. Because the taxes are decently high now as it is, and for me, it's yeah. just me speaking, yeah. I could care less. Okay. Yeah, a lot of taxes for stupid things. Yeah. Go for it. This, I think, would be would be more beneficial for a long term. Yeah. To where you've got to pay a couple hundred dollars extra year in taxes to have something that's sustainable. That's me. So I appreciate that support for the project. I know that we have a lot of our friends and neighbors in in our community that don't feel that way, and and that's fair. And that's why there's a big piece of this that's unknown. One of the reasons why, in answer to a question earlier, I'm so aggressive in wanting to do fundraising for this is because I think the more that we can raise, the more that we show the taxpayers that this community is invested in this process, in this initiative. And I think that we have some energy in this room that can help us along that, along that road, number one. Number two, I think showing that initiative 
and raising as much money as we can makes it difficult, honestly, I'll say it politically, for the school board, the superintendent, and the taxpayers to say no to the process. We can get our kids, and our kids are the ones out there raising the money. It's awfully hard to say no, number one. Number two, we take that information, it's a lot easier to go into um, companies here in town and express to them how close we are. We just need a little more help from, you know, from, uh, you know, from, our, from some, some of our business community. And we have a number of ways that they can assist. Um, so I, I recognize that as a challenge in our community. I know how painful it is to pay taxes. I, I, you know, I know just what I pay, and I, I'm sure I, you know, a lot of you folks are paying, paying a lot too. So um, I'm not here because I, you know, um, for any other reason than I think it's the right thing to do for our children. I know it comes at a cost. But everything good, a small cost. Everything good comes at a cost. That should be a small cost. Big to long term. The other thing is, we, you asked about like, like communities and what we, so a lot of times you, you, you have commitments for over X amount of years, say it's five years, and you have X amount per year, you don't have everything up front. But we do offer the financing programs where you, know, you, you got the field, right? You have half of it paid off, but you have, you have these commitments for the remaining balance of the project. And so we've done that in the past as well. It's just, you know, funding's always, it's either funding, it's either, it's either funding or permitting. One, it's the one issue. It, it, Permitting probably if the funding's an issue, the permitting's gonna fly by. If you know permitting is an issue, usually the funding's there. It's weird. But there are things that we can do right now with our existing facility. Um, you know, I, I, I happen to be associated with a woman who owns a woman-owned professional is a, a women's professional football team. Where do they play? They don't play at Gillette, they play at high schools. They have to rent that space. You know, there are other programs like that um, that I think are opportunities to create revenue streams. We can't do that on the existing field. We have a synthetic turf field. We have that opportunity. We'll need cooperation from our school board, from our you know um, administration, um, to utilize this, view the resource, and then utilize the resource differently than we are. I understand why we're not doing those things now. Playability. You know, if we if we maximize the use of this field to this to the extent we're talking about now, it's unplayable by the middle of September in the fall. It's unplayable halfway through the season in the spring. We can change that. We flip that script and get it funded. A lot of hard work to get it funded initially, but I think over time it probably could pay for itself, you know, um, structured correctly. But it's a different way of looking at the utilization of the resource. It's not just the high school field. It's a community. I look back to our taxpayer conversation. As a taxpayer, I view it as a community resource. I'm with right. you. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Any other questions? I know you got some more. Come on. Oh, yeah. well, he does. I know he does. Come on. I do, but I want to, I'd like to review your materials. I'll probably send you a good email. Okay. Yeah. Um, happy to. You know, happy to answer anything you got. That being said, I'm going to close our our presentation tonight. I want to thank Field Turf representatives Christopher Hall. That was the easiest presentation we've done. And I want to thank all of you. You haven't got my email yet. Ah! <laughs> thank you guys for coming out as well. And. Um, uh, hopefully we'll, this will grow into a larger initiative with uh, as much support as we need and we have more money than we need to pay these guys or somebody like them. All right. Thank you to Grand Town Media for coming out. Andrew, you're good.